Hello, and welcome again to Reading Together, as we are continuing to read through Heaven Taken by Storm by the Puritan Thomas Watson. And we are rapidly approaching the end of this book. Uh, so this is our third to the last um, week of reading through it. And we are studying this week chapter 16 in which Watson lays out for us motives for exhorting all Christians to offer violence. And so if you are indeed reading this and following along, um, then then I think I can safely say <laughs> that you have been s- sufficiently exhorted to offer violence. Uh, that that if, if, you, if you have indeed read this book, um, then, then you, will, you will not have the excuse um, on Judgment Day to say that you have not uh, been called uh, to offer violence for the kingdom, to, to live in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, to use Paul's words from Ephesians chapter 4, which is a good thing. And so um, I agree with, uh, with whoever put together the PDF um, version of this book that you can find over on, um, over on um, monergism.com. Calm and that this that they lay out this chapter as as giving twenty seven motives um, and so they basically break down uh, most of it amounts to um, to breaking this down paragraph by paragraph right um, but the but the the essential layout of this chapter is um, that I, I do agree with them that there's um, about twenty seven different points um, that Watson makes diving in uh, with some of them being being very short, and some of them uh, going into a little bit longer, like when he um, makes the point that a motive for uh, for us to be violent is, uh, is is that we receive a kingdom, right? Um, there he, he uh, we can break that point down even, even further where he talks about the great immunities that the heaven gives to us and the great excellencies that it gives to us. And so, um, but then after that, in the last paragraph, he gives us one final consideration over the fact that, um, that we are indeed dependent upon the grace of Christ. And so, um, so I won't go through all of those 27 motives, and nor are we going to have time uh, this week in this, uh, in, this, in this audio format to go through all 27 motives. But instead, um, I'm, I'm just going to pick my nine favorite parts um, and that's uh, and I wasn't trying to limit it to two nine uh, but I'm just these are the nine um, thoughts that I just wanted uh, definitely wanted to to, to, to point you towards um, and to and to call attention upon and so please uh, more so this chapter than in <laughs> than in the other since it is uh, the longest reading that we've done so far in this book um, and and there's so many of these motives that Watson discusses that um, that I'm not discussing. Um, please let me know which ones particularly stood out to you, what the reason for that is. Um, so the first thing that really stuck out to me um, was his motive over on in the physical uh, format of this book in page 72, where he talks about uh, that, that this violence for heaven is the grand business of our lives, is motive number Three, and I highlighted this portion of that paragraph. He says, "We did not come here only to eat and drink and wear fine clothes, but the end for our living is to be violent for the kingdom of glory." Mm. <laughs> take that, take that, and meditate over that. Right? We did not come here, meaning earth, meaning this this physical life that we have here, this this presently physical. Life, our, our eternity will be physical as well, um, but in glorified bodies. But we did not come here into this life only to eat and drink and wear fine clothes. And yet, how many, how many of us are 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 drawn away by the cares of this world? Are we drawn away by the pleasures of this world? And we do indeed think that we've only come here to to eat and drink and wear fine clothes, to, to find our comfort, to find our enjoyment, to find pleasure. But that is not the purpose for which we were made. We were put here to be violent for God's kingdom, right? And he goes on in there to say, if only the body be tended, 
This would be to trim the scabbard and let the blade rust, to preserve the lumber and let the child be burned. God sends, sends us into the world as a merchant sends his goods to trade for him beyond the sea. So God sends us here to follow a spiritual trade, to serve him and to save our souls. And so is this indeed what we're doing? Is this a good motive for, uh, the, uh, the, the, that we follow by trying to fulfill the purpose for which God has sent us here? The next thing that stood out to me is on on page 75, and it's the motive in which he says um, that this blessed violence in religion would be preventative of much sin. This violence would prevent much sin in us. And I love that he he goes down, um, and Watson, this is a theme that Watson in, in a lot of his writings um, uh, goes back to time and time again, but in kind of the middle of that paragraph, when he, uh, after he quotes, after he uh cites uh, Matthew 13, 25, saying, while men slept, the enemy sowed tares, referring to that parable of the wheat and the tares. He says this, when Satan finds men in a drowsy condition, their sleeping time is his tempting time. But by holy violence, we prevent the devil's design. We are so busy with salvation that we have no leisure to listen to temptation, right? And then he goes on and says, Jerome advised his friend to always be well employed, that when Satan came with temptation, he might find him working in the vineyard, right? And Watson says uh, something very similar to this in some of his other writings, where he says that uh, the idle man is is Satan's plaything, right? Um, That he, or no, the idle man tempts the devil to tempt him. That's that's what he says, Uh, that when we are idle, we tempt the devil to tempt us. And so in the same way, um, if we are if we are violent for the kingdom, if we're if we are if we are busy um, with the busyness that God has given us to do, the restful busyness, as he'll make that point, as he just made that point um, a couple um, uh, two points before that one, when he said the holy violence brings rest, right? It's a restful busyness. But if we have occupied ourselves with the kingdom of God, it would keep us and prevent us from many sins that would come to us in idleness that come to us when we are putting off what what god has called us to do Um, the next thing that stood out that particularly stood out to me um, since many of these many of the points that watson makes uh did stick out to me is um under this motive on page 78 where he says the more violence we put forth in religion the greater measure of glory we shall have. And this simply struck out, stuck, stuck out to me because, um, you know, this, this, this whole notion of being different degrees of glory in heaven or different degrees of reward in heaven um, is, you know, just a, a, a thought that you know, comes into your mind, um, but never really given a whole lot of thought and a whole lot of attention to it. But the fact that he, you know, kind of goes into it and he, um, begin, and he uh, goes further in that paragraph to say that there are degrees in glory of heaven seems to me beyond dispute. And he go, he says, um, and he goes on to say that uh, Calvin and many of the other ancient fathers considered that as well. And one of the portions that I highlighted is where he says, consider then seriously, the more violent we are for heaven, the more work and the more work we do for God, the greater will be our reward. The hotter our zeal, the brighter our crown. Could we hear the blessed souls departed speaking to us from heaven? Surely they would say, were we to leave heaven a while and dwell on earth again, we would do God a thousand times more service than we have ever done. We would pray with more life, act with more zeal. For now we see the more we have labored, the more astonishing is our joy and the more flourishing our crown. I have no doubt that is certainly the case that those who are uh, that those who are in the presence of Christ now um, that if, if 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 they were given the option of a of a redo um, having having witnessed the glories of heaven um, would absolutely uh, go and uh, come back to this earth and would offer far more violence would offer far more zealous striving for Christ um, than they ever did in this life right and so um, 
but we know that heaven will be um, will be a, a, a great blessing. Will be a, a place of, of 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 marvelous riches for us, right? And so let us be more violent now while we are actually able to apply that violence to the kingdom of heaven, right? Um, or as Christ told us, let us seek that treasure that is in heaven, that moths cannot devour and thieves cannot steal and rust cannot destroy. The next um, motive that he offers to us that um, stood out to me was the very next one where God tells us, or where Watson tells us that upon our violence for the kingdom, God has promised mercy. And it's interesting. He goes in, uh, um, goes in on this this point um, and expounds upon Matthew 7, 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And so this point, he, he, he breaks down by those three categories of that verse. Ask, seek, and knock. And in that ask, he tells us to, to, to ask, to ask boldly, right? And he gives this wonderful line. He says, King Asuherus stood with his golden scepter and said to Queen Esther, Ask, and it shall be given thee to half the kingdom. But God says more. Ask, and he will give you the whole kingdom. Mm. So how much more should we indeed ask our Heavenly Father that he, it is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom, right? And so how much more should we ask that he indeed does that, right? And then uh, probably the most interesting part of this point, though, is when he speaks of seek and you shall find. But then he spends his time addressing um, the question that many, uh, from, from, from Luke 13, 24, many will seek to enter in and shall not be able, right? And which is a wonderful point, right? <laughs> that if, if Christ in one spot says, seek and you shall find, and then in another point says that many will seek to enter and won't be able to enter, right? What do we, what do, we do with that? And he says they seek in the wrong manner. And he gives us a couple of ways that they seek, that they seek ignorantly, right? They're, they're going after different form, different ways um, to try to reach salvation that can never actually reach salvation. They seek proudly, right? They seek on their own merits, right? Trying to seek the kingdom, um, but not in Christ's name, not in his strength, not by his grace. Or they seek lazily, right? Or they seek hypocritically. And so, um, oh, and one last, they seek inconstantly. Um, because mercy did not come presently, they give up seeking, right? And so I just think that's a, a very interesting point for him to make. Um, speaking of that, um, that, 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 that there is a reason why those who do seek um, don't find, and it's because they're not seeking in the right manners. They're seeking wrongly. Next, um, he gives a, the next motive that he gives, and I think is worth mentioning as well too. He says, this holy violence will not hinder men in their secular employments. Um, and so this is a, this is a great point to make, right? Because um, we see that work, um, which is what he's speaking of here, is secular work, right? The tasks that we are called to do, providing for our families. Uh, that was, work was, was, not a product of the fall, work became more difficult because of the fall, right? But God created us as a people to work. And I think it's, it's, it's a very good point that Watson makes um, that, 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 that our, our, our violence for heaven is not going to hinder our, our genuine efforts and work that we put forth here in this world, right? But then he takes up kind of a similar... Um, a similar objection to one of the ones that he addressed in the previous chapter, where he says, but some may say, we are so encumbered in the world that all time for religion is swallowed up. We cannot get a break from our calling, that is, from their work, to read or to pray. And I love his answer. So, he, like I said, he already kind of answered this objection in the last chapter, but now he's addressing it a little bit differently here. And he says, very plainly, if your trade be such 
that you cannot allow yourselves time for your souls, then your trade is unlawful. Man, mic drop. <laughs> right? Oh, that so many would would take that simple statement and really apply it. If your trade be such that you cannot allow yourselves time for your souls, then your trade is unlawful. If you don't have time for heaven because you are so busy with work, then something's sinful, then, then something's broken with your work, right? And then he actually goes on and expounds that a little bit more. Right? He says that there, there are two things that make a trade, a work, unlawful. First, when a person deals in such commodities, which they know cannot be used without sin, such as selling on the black market or selling idolatrous pictures or crucifixes, right? So, so let me know. So obviously, if you work in a sinful industry, right, then that's, and that is a sinful work. But then two, and he notes this, when their trade involves them so deeply in worldly business that they cannot mind eternity or make one importunate cry to the throne of grace. They are so much in the shop that they cannot be in the closet. If there is such a trade to be found, then doubtless it is unlawful, right? So if your work takes up so much of your time that there is no time, then oh yeah, then absolutely that would be unlawful. But, <laughs> but then he goes on and he makes this point. But let not men lay this problem upon their trade, right? Because here's the reality of the thing. It's probably not work's fault. Most likely not. <laughs> so let not men lay this problem upon their trade, but upon themselves. Their trade would give them time to serve God, but their covetousness will not give them time. Oh, how many put a fallacy upon their own souls and cheat themselves into hell. And that's the reality. That's the reality. Is it, is it, I mean, we see this in, in kind of the stereotypical pictures of the corporate world, right? Where where the, the job itself doesn't make a claim that the person has to work 60, 80 hours a week, right? No, 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 but it's in order to compete. It's in order to make yourself known, right? It's in order to make, to, to, to show that you are willing to put forth that work, right? Then you have to give all of that time. But now here's the deal. That's not, not necessarily the, the work itself's fault. Where, where's the Christian's priorities? Is it really the best to chase after the next promotion to the neglect of our own souls? Hmm. Next, skipping a little bit over to page 82 in the physical copy, this motive. If you neglect the offering of violence now, there will be no help for you after death. And this is, man, this point is just so good uh, and so so powerful um, the way that he makes it. Um, I just want to read it. <laughs> so he says this, when men shall open their eyes in another world and see into what a damned condition they have sinned themselves. Oh, now what, what they, what would they not do? What violence would they not use if there were a possibility they might be saved when once the door of mercy is shut, if God would make a new terms far harder than before, they would readily bind themselves to them. If God should say to the sinner after death, would you be content to return to earth and live there under a harrow of persecution a thousand years for my sake? They would say, yes, Lord. I will subscribe to this and endure the world's fury if only I may have thy favor at last. But will you be content to serve an apprenticeship in hell a thousand years, where you shall feel the worm gnawing and the fire burning? Yes, Lord, even in hell I submit to thee, so, so that after a thousand years I may have a release and that bitter cup may pass away from me. But will you? For every lie you have told endure the rack. Will you, for every oath that you have sworn, fill a bottle of tears? Will you lie ten thousand years in sackcloth and ash for every sin you have committed? Yes, Lord. All this and more, if thou requirest, I will subscribe to. I am content now to use any violence, if I may, but at last be admitted into thy kingdom. No, God will say. There shall be no condition 
proposed to you no possibility of favor, that you shall lie forever among the damned, and who is able to dwell with everlasting burnings. O oh, therefore be wise in time. Now while God's terms are more easy, embrace Christ in heaven, for after death there will be nothing to be done for your souls. The sinner and the furnace shall never be parted. If that's not a motive, I don't know what is. Next. Continuing that same theme. He says, How without all defense will you be left if you neglect this violence for heaven? And I point to this motive because at the end, I love the the... I love what he says of God's wrath that will be poured out against sinners, this, this eternal wrath that will be poured out against sinners. And he says, Though the sinner shall drink a sea of wrath, yet he shall not drink one drop of injustice. Hmm. And brothers and sisters, that is true. <laughs> For all the eternity of wrath that sinners will face, they will not drink one drop of injustice from God. It will be pure, righteous, good justice of God. There's not one ounce of injustice in God's damnation of souls to hell. Next, on page 84, he begins another motive for offering violence, in which he says, this sweating for heaven is not to endure long. Mm. And this is such a, such a great point to make. Right? And we've been, we've been studying the last verses of, of Ephesians, speaking of our spiritual warfare um, that we have, that we are waging each day against the kingdom of darkness and Realizing that all of our life is war and that we're never allowed in this lifetime to drop our guard, but that one day, whether we, whether it's through our deaths or whether it's through the return of Christ, we will finally be at complete rest. Um, we will put away the armor of God and receive the white robes um, that Christ clothes us with, right? And so I think with that in mind, I think this phrase of Watson, um, this very, very encouraging phrase of Watson, um, is 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 one to meditate on. He says, "Christians, you have but a little way to go, a little more violence, a few more tears to shed, a few more Sabbaths to keep, and then your hopes shall be crowned with the beatific sight of God." Mm. And you know, if there's maybe one quote to take away from this book, grab that one. We just have a little little way to go. Just a little bit more violence, a few more tears to shed, a few more Sabbaths to keep. And then our hopes will be crowned what, with what? With the, the pleasures of heaven? Oh, I mean, yes, those. But with the ultimate pleasure of heaven, with the beatific sight of God, with seeing our Savior face to face, beholding the glory of God in the face of Christ. And the last thing that I want to point out from this chapter is how he ends the chapter by saying, yet this caution I must necessarily insert. Though we shall not obtain the kingdom without violence, yet it shall also not be obtained for our violence. When we have done all look up to Christ in free grace. This is what I've been <laughs> adding this whole time into the book and making sure that we understand that Watson is, is not telling us in this book. He's not calling us to work for our own salvation, to work as if we can justify ourselves and earn our place to heaven, right? No, we're still completely dependent upon the grace of God. But what he's what he is doing is he's exhorting us um, the very exhortation that James makes, that faith without works is dead, right? To not be a people who presume upon grace, who you know, 
know, as I mentioned last week of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who, who believed that grace is cheap. Grace is free, brothers and sisters, but it is not cheap. It is costly. It cost Christ his blood. And that is the exact point that Watson is making here, is that we are saved by grace. Amen. Praise the Lord. There is nothing that we can do. But once we are saved, our sanctification will involve striving. It will involve works, right? But I love that, that he makes this known there at the end. When when we have done all, when we have strained with every amount of violence that we could offer for the kingdom of God, look up to Christ and free grace. Because that's all we have, right? That's our hope of heaven, right? When we have, when we have exerted all of our efforts, done everything that we possibly could, we still, as we approach the Lord and we see him high and lifted up upon his throne, we will still say nothing in my hands I bring simply to the cross I cling, right? That is the great prayer of every Christian. That is the only claim of every Christian. And oh, brothers and sisters, that is enough. And so, I pray that we would be violent for the kingdom. And I pray that that violence for the kingdom would come from the free grace that we have in Christ. Next week, we will spend our, our penultimate time studying this book, examining chapter 17, in which Watson will point out to us a few hindrances um, that will keep us back from offering violence. And so, until then, grace and peace be to you.